Hello everyone, today we will be taking a look at Disco Elysium and its portrayal of reality through its dialogue and plot. Although this video will be focusing on the philosophical indications that can be obtained out of this video game, I will try to hold back from using too much of philosophical jargon to hopefully make it all the more comprehensible. But do not expect any LI5. At points that seem boggy, go ahead and stop the video to maybe take a look at some of the more important terms that you might come across. I will also leave some links below for terminological assistance. But before we get too focused on the introduction, let's dive right in. For the analysis, I will be applying the insights that Slavoj Žižek gives in his article Can One Be a Hegelian Today, published in the Philosophical Saloon, in a seminal book, Sublime Object of Ideology. A link of the article can be found in the description, so let's get started. Disco Elysium is an isometric artsy RPG with a very idiosyncratic system at its heart. This system combined with the story and the themes threaded into the game make it up to the great RPG that it is. I wanted to especially keep this video free of spoilers for the others to enjoy it more so I will be trying to explain what the game is effectively portraying by taking one of the side quests that you come across as an exemplary notion of the game. You take the role of a police militia detective in a town called Revachal, in a parallel universe that is only different in its content but the form of how our history has unfolded is kept in a very interesting way, trying to understand the nature of a hanging that happened behind a cafe hotel a week ago. While going through the town, you come across many well-written characters who are sometimes intertwined in with the plot and sometimes in a way that the game talks of itself, of its project through a side quest that seems completely irrelevant. The side quest that I will be taking as example is the curse on the bookstore. The quest starts if you try to go past some curtains on the far side of the bookshop in the first area of the game and the shopkeeper warns you several times and if you look through the curtains, not going fully through, you can use this to snatch the task from the shopkeeper. The shopkeeper seems to be very much interested in parapsychology and the paranormal. She gives you the task to go up to the chimney, to the uppermost part of the apartment and do something about an entity before sending you off. The game itself always lures you into a sort of paranormality with the Inland Empire trait. So that there's context to what I mean, the character functions almost like a person with many split personalities. All of them in their one-sidedness assert a certain aspect that seems important about the situation at hand. For example, the logic trait, if it is high enough in a given situation, can give you a tip or a logical conclusion about what has happened or what has been meant by what the NPC has said, but it is never completed in its own. Other trait projections are intertwined also with logic in the sense that they also fill in the gaps in their partiality. Back to the crux of the matter. The narration of the side quest almost always takes this turn of, oh yes, there's something there, behind there, behind the veil. Anyway, the quest in itself is pretty straightforward. You go through the many floors and rooms of the building encountering many failed businesses, not knowing precisely why they all failed. The shopkeeper has a pretty good idea on what is going on. The curse of economic depression is the cause of it, not economy and the material relations that it is caught in, but some sort of parasite, paranormality that causes the material relations to collapse. The only reason why her business hasn't failed is the dream catcher in the mambo jumbo that the shaman gave her, while that is so in her understanding. I was wondering if this anxiety, being very stern and all, kept her business up by effectively scapegoating a curse, a sort of narrative with a hole in it that sustains her idea of reality, or was it so that she needed this idea of a curse to relate to her beliefs, not the situation at hand? I think the question lays precisely between these two possibilities. She even gets her daughter to stand outside in the cold the whole day to invite people into the shop. This we truly understand when we come across her after going through the whole apartment complex and end up back down again, telling her the truth that the witch or the geist that she was so worried about was just a die maker in the uppermost part of the tower does not really change anything. There's always a rationalization of what is going on on which is sustained by an inability to go behind the curtain. The funniest part for me is that the curtain itself functions for the character exactly in the same way. If she were to step beyond the curtain, she would notice that there's nothing but the curtain. Maybe an historical anecdote will clear things up. Zoixis, a famous painter in ancient Greece, had a painting competition with Parhasius to determine who was the greater painter. Zoixis revealed his painting to be a painting of grapes, so real that the birds pecked at the wall. And when Zoixis told Parhasius to pull aside the curtain, the curtain itself turned out to be the painting. The idea here is that the essence of things is not behind the veil, but the veil itself, which produces the beyond of things itself. To give a quick philosophical intermission on the topic. We have to take a look at how the side quest presents the inconsistencies at hand. 
and how these inconsistencies are in turn abstracted by the many narrative forms that we encounter. The main inconsistency in this quest is the curse that is set upon the building, but funnily enough, there is always an interrogation on it. For example, the rolling rags, whether if it's part of the cursed area or not, some argue that it is, some argue that it isn't. What we do not get out of this is that this back and forth with the scope of the given state is bound to an inner inconsistency, and these are in turn covered by a bigger narrative. In some sense, the material relations go on as long as people try to speculate on the inner logic of the curse. The shopkeeper is free from the curse as long as the curtains stay closed and our shamanic equipment function, such as dream catchers, etc. In his article, Can One Be a Hegelian Today, Zizek exclaims over and over that it is no longer possible in our day and time to fall back into wholly consistent and totality grasping, not in a political sense, but in terms of an explanation scope, narratives over the state of things. And I quote, with the rupture I've referred to, we enter a new universe that compels us to leave behind the notion of a consistent view of all of reality. Even Marxism, at least in its predominant form, can still be viewed as a mode of thinking that belongs to the old universe. It elaborates quite a consistent view of social totality, in some versions even of the all of reality. The rupture Zizek mentions is the rupture of Kantor and Gödel in logic. Back to our topic. So the inconsistencies of the economic depression curse that has befallen the area are conceptualized in two ways. One is that of the paranormal, the shopkeeper, let's call this the metaphysical or pre-critical in the sense that it sets the stage for a state of things outside of time and place that pervade into the material relations as we have stated, collapsing them, hence the economic depression. If we take a closer look at this narrative, this paranormality always requires a normality to function. So to speak, in being outside of space and time, it is already bound to what happens in our given reality, to our space and time. There must already be the economic collapse for there to be the geist. One could even ask, maybe whether if the shopkeeper was behind the failure of the businesses themselves, and whether she herself is the geist that she projects onto the die maker at the top of the tower of the apartment. The other side of it is that the position of the die maker, that there is no consistency as to why things have failed. As she mentions, she can still upkeep her workshop, and the bookstore too is still in business. When we uncover the histories of the failed businesses, we seem to notice that these projects were just not in the right place and time to do what they aspired to do. But the point is not to accept the things as they are, that all is inconsistent, and that we are rambling through randomness, and that we have to eventually accept our own fate uh, within this mess, but that the inconsistencies arise from the fact that we are always included in this picture. That our partial position is always in relation to the substance that we are in relation with. To put it another way, we need a third option to come to terms with this economic curse that is not only a part of the apartment complex, but taints all the areas inconsistently, much like how grace of God has been distributed symmetrically, but which itself opens up the space for inquiry onto the place in which God resides. And so, the paranormality and the consistent view of inconsistency that the die maker, although the second position is crucial, are not enough but that this inconsistency should be inflated into the whole of material relations to uncover the truth as to why this inconsistency persists if the economic system we build stands on such defined crystalline principles. This acceptance of our fate also correlates to the game's lore. The town of Revachal can be seen as the monument for the failure of revolution. The idea that there is still some social order is held up by the mafia who uses the workers' union as a puppet for their own needs and power. In the midst of this, the enterprises of many get lost in or destroyed by what is not directly addressed, namely the economic regression at hand and the general ethical collapse of the society. Hence the hanging in the backyard and all that other stuff. Another interesting and crucial part of the side quest was the constant ascent up to the tower to meet the die maker, waiting at some sort of sublime. But we are faced with nothing but someone who saw the failures of the many business activities in the building and even worked for one of them, knowing all their stories. Having gotten to the essence of all the appearances of business failures, we are told that it is nothing but these appearances themselves. One business concept did not hold up to the cultural background of Revachol, one was too ambitious and couldn't manage fiscally to keep itself up, and so on. Things become chaotic in the sense that we come to realize the contingency of all the happenings around us. There is necessity, of course, in the sense of cultural acceptance of product, circumstantial economic affairs, etc. But the way we plan things accordingly, the way we try to change the substance almost always hits back. The die maker who just came to make dyes for business survived even the failures of those businesses. But of course, having stepped beyond the curtain and gone back to the shopkeeper, we immediately become an other. 
that, so to speak, knows too much for his own good. And she even goes so far to refute our explanation of things as having been corrupted by the witch, the essence of all this evil, after we say that the die maker has called out the inconsistencies of the curse. The game also gives a great insight into how ideology works. The shopkeeper already accepts her own reality's failure at hand. Remember how she says that she can tell charlatans from real paranormal investigators? By encapsulating itself with the real world affairs, the whole vision in some sense includes itself out. Much like the thief that calls out, the thief is getting away, catch him. The most interesting part is that when the player character tells her that there's no witch, she asks then where the curse comes from and we call her out on the inconsistencies of the narrative. We're caught in an epistemological trap by which we're accused of having been corrupted by the wrong source, the source of evil itself. There is in some sense no way out of the horizon in which we are embedded, only the dissolution of it. Like I have stated, it is also not that by creating this fantasy of the other that things function, but precisely because it is not the case that things go the way they are for the shopkeeper. I have to quote Zizek from his book Sublime Object of Ideology. The crucial paradox of this relationship between the social effectivity of the commodity exchange and the consciousness of it is that, to use again a concise formulation by Zon Rettel, this non-knowledge of the reality is part of its very essence. The social effectivity of the exchange process is a kind of reality which is possible on condition that individuals partaking in it are not aware of its proper logic. That is, a kind of reality whose very ontological consistency implies a certain non-knowledge of its participants. If we come to know too much, this would pierce the true functioning of social reality. This reality would dissolve itself. This is probably the fundamental dimension of ideology. Ideology is not simply a false consciousness, an illusory representation of reality. It is rather this reality itself which is already to be conceived as ideological. Ideological is a social reality whose very existence implies the non-knowledge of its participants as to its essence. That is, the social effectivity, the very reproduction of which implies that the individuals do not know what they are doing. Ideological is not the false consciousness of a social being, but this being itself insofar as it is supported by false consciousness. The subject can enjoy a symptom only insofar as its logic escapes him. Does not the false consciousness, the idea of a metaphysical, all-encompassing energy with its evildoers and such only cover the fact of the social reality in which the reason why her business does not fail is through her own iron hand by which she exploits her own daughter and even tries to take out the only competition in the building by way of this paranormal idea that she is wound up in? Or maybe the only reason why her business did not fail was the fact that her business is merely mandatory within the community as it is the only bookstore? The only way that she can keep to herself, so to speak, stay the way she is and take part in the economic exchange in the same curse she designates as the root of all is by abstracting from it. Or to end with a quote from family. 